Hi, everybody. I have a confession to make. And the confession is that I'm addicted to emotions. I carve for them. I live for them. Imagine a world without emotions. Nothing. Just peace. You don't feel anything. Let's try it for a second. Yeah, that's a meditation class. It's awesome because it lasts only for 30 minutes. But for today, let's talk about why emotions are important. Emotions make us who we are. We, the self-consciousness, like we feel things. A lot of our decisions are carved by emotions, like love, survival, being. Our moral is, is carved by emotions. Do you feel something if you look at those images? Do you resonate with those kind of people? So we are living in an in a ex extraordinary time where most of our daily day experiences are in a new world, in a digital world. Our phones, our computers, our watches, a lot of digital things are uh, around us, and we use that roughly around like four hours a day, which is a huge amount of time compared to previous times where we did not have that medium, where we read books, we went out with friends, where we had a lot of emotional experiences. And the question is, if we design those experiences, do we consider that the person who is using it should feel something? We question a lot of things, we, we, we create functionality with a lot of things, but feel, do they feel something? And Maya and Janela quoted this really interesting quote, which I, I think connects really well with this thing. So people forget what you do or what you say but people never forget how you make them feel. So, can that translate to a product design? How we want pe people to feel, not just what they see. So, what makes a, a remarkable product, a remarkable experience? Aaron Butter has quoted this, this, this beautiful quote saying that Remarkability only happens when we achieve the plateau of delight. And what is that delight? It's this, this feeling inside of us. It's not a practical thing, it's a feeling. And his, in his book of Designing for Emotions, he introduced this interesting pyramid. I guess you have seen a, a pyramid of, of basic human needs, the Maslow's pyramid. So you start from bottom down, the things you need to go up. So that translates quite well to the product design. We start with functionality, task-oriented thing, what that product does. Then we go, is it reliable? Can we use it every day? I guess all of you have seen this Twitter whale when you know, the product is not available, you can't use that. And then we get to a field of usable. That's where a lot of user designers today work. Does that, is the product usable for us? But if we look further down, we see there's um, this interesting area which only few products cross. Is it pleasurable to use? Do we feel something if we use that product? And in the end, does it have a meaning? Why is that product there? An interesting thing how people perceive the world is we think about why worst before we think how and what. We question the thing inside our brain, why this thing does that before we question how and why. These are, that's the part where our decisions are made. None of that we even sometimes know of that. So 
if we continue with this thing of pleasure and feel, how we create products that are pleasurable to use, this, this remarkable experience that Darren Watton mentions, and how designers can grade that experience with using technology we have. And previously, as mentioned, the storytelling is the ancient way of explaining and sharing ideas with people. And that storytelling has come to a world where we now live, a digital world. It started way back with really simplistic computers where there were no visual design. It was purely text-based, or if the visual design came to it, it was really limited. Technology did not allow us to put emotions in it. Like first websites, which looked horrible, but just communicated the idea with a, with a, with a text. And as I mentioned, we're living in a time where technology becomes cheaper and cheaper to use, which means that if we go further and look at the stories we can tell, the way we can tell the stories, these are not just because of practical. Like, I can tell a story with just setting it out, but can I make a person who reads that story feel something? And technology allows us nowadays to create a remarkable stories, using animation, using imagery, using videos. None of that was available just 50 years ago in a digital world. But we don't use it really, or do we? So here's an example of a website I really love recently. And there are a lot of great examples on the market where emotional design plays a huge role. So if you've not heard this product Intercom, they basically deal with uh, helping you to achieve connections with your customers online. So, yeah, what makes this thing special? This is a business product. To communicate the idea of functionality with visual language and using that in a way that tries to pro uh, elicit emotions. You looking at it and seeing that's different, that's interesting. I could, I, we could do it in a different way. So let's have a look at the competitors on the market, for example. That's one of the competitors. So if you compare those experiences, do you feel different? They both do the same thing. They both have the same functionality. They both have usability there, but they just communicate it in a different way. They add this level of pleasure in the small details. Here's another competitor doing the exact same thing, but just communicating in a different way. And communication can happen in storytelling in many ways. So we can have that emotional communication in small lines. We can like, create characters in our applications, which are purely unpractical, but really human, because humans are about emotions. Even though we think we, are, we try to be really practical, try to be you know, functional, do the proper thing, everything which strives us or creates us in this world is emotion. The reason we love make pond, like pond with friends, make new connections, go out and come here. Raise a hand if you came here for just a practical reason. Like you just came here for a reason that you want to adopt the information and go home. <laughs> yep, and that you're the one percent of people who actually do those kind of things, who actually even, you know can hide their emotions and be, but everybody else comes here for many reasons, and a lot of those em reasons are emotional, not really practical reasons. Like, as I mentioned, Pony, coming here, meeting people, having conversations, getting inspired. Those kind of things happen in real life, but can, can those happen in real uh, products? Yes, they do. They can, ha <laughs> they, can, they can be our product, in our products, and technology allows us to do things that never before. We can create emotion experiences in a much cheaper way than, than before. Those kind of experiences, like here, where we talk about interactions, which in some ways could be really simple. I'll push the button, and that's it. You know, <laughs> that's the interaction. But what, what I, what, can we go deeper and take that interaction to a level where you feel that's fun to use, that's something that you didn't expect? Can we add that extra level of, of uh, being interesting? being pleasant, being something more than just functional or usable. 
another great example. A lot of you have maybe seen this. Absolutely unpractical, but just fun. <laughs> I feel you laughing, which means you have emotions, which when you are emotional, congratulations, you're a human being. So, but that sometimes, we sometimes question it's that, it's, it's why that extra step? You know, it's, it, we have the functionality, we have the usability, it's reli reliable. You know, why we do need to ding, deal with things like these? You know, these might even upset people. But I like a quote from Slack, people working there, is going, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just too fast. So, going to extra mile for a smile. And that's my quote today, is taking that extra mile to put a smile on a person's face or make them feel while they use our digital products, as they would feel if they go out and enjoy their life, is, is something which I, I think is my mission right now as well. It's not just about usability, and it's not ju just functionality, it's something that we feel. And if you look further down and what technology will allow us to do is is, is just around the corner. As designers, we should already start to think about it, that the, the screen medium we're using, it's gonna be obsolete, no matter what. And if you look the past, the past will confirm the future, and if you see the trend in 10 years' time, we most probably we have a lot more mediums to communicate with. We, we might have a, a something which is in our house, like a, like a screen projected in the air, um, where you can interact with the experience. And, you might question, that's not a practical way, you know, I can just use a screen, why I need to, you know, bring it in my home? But that's emotion experience, to feel things closer to me, to feel in the, in the environment, to see how they look like, maybe I want to purchase something, a very good example of concept, which is not real, really there yet, but in the future it might be. So you have an assistant, you can say you want to buy some shoes, and the shoes appear in your house. Emotion experience, why I can go to the store, I can just look a picture, you know? But emotions, the reason why those kind of experiences is great is purely about emotions. And to put us in a situation where we make decisions for the businesses, we buy goods. If you go to a store and you want to buy yourself a shoe, you get a, a person who would come and help you. They would smile to you, they would look for the right shoes. People look for similar experiences in the digital world, yet we don't consider them always. We think about functionality and usability first before we actually get there. Or even if we get functionality and usability right and it's usable as well, then we say it's good enough. People can use it. It makes business right. But can we take it further? And finally, the, the dip of that uh, pyramid is, is meaningful. And it answers the question why? Why? This product does it the thing that it does. And it's not just about the brand. Let's say, oh, yeah, our business or, or what we try to create is um, we're going to try to create a, a product which is, you know, economically friendly. It it's, it's doesn't leave a footprint, but we actually don't do it. We don't really necessarily present it to the customers. So here's a good example. No offense if people from Swedbank are here. I just m mask out the logo, you know? just the people. So here's a great banking, a regular banking experience. I have my balance, just for people who don't speak English. I, I couldn't get their English version because I'm using the bank, so I just use something which is available. So basically it's about your money, your balance, your banking everyday things. But your question, is that a meaningful experience? Can you take it further down? And here's an example of um, a modern banking which is sort of really which has a really strong why we do it. And it, it's not about just your money. Your money is just um, a, a thing which you can go and fulfill your dreams. And that banking application is about your dreams, achieving goals and saving money towards your goals. And they say it out in the product. They make the product around their idea. Not just saying, oh, we are bank. We actually wish you have a great dreams and you know, bring the money to us and we just make sure that you're a great person, but they do it in a the product. So they allow you create goals, try to 
same money towards those goals, and they let you know what's your progress. Are you making it or not? So they, they, they add this meaningful value to this money, not just saying, oh, here's a balance, send money, whatever. Another good example. Uh, here's the, the website, I guess a lot of people from UK know, we have one here, which is uh, read.co.uk, which is a job listing site. You, you go there for search it's to yourself a job. And in previous presentations, we found out that actually that developers are willing to look for new offers, but they are not willing to go and you know, search for them. And readcode.qk is, is just about listing of jobs. You just go there, look for a, a job opening, and then apply yourself. But why people do those kind of things? So here's one of the things I was happy to be part of, of the creation process, which is a meet Frank, which is about yourself or you. So first, understand what, what actually motivates you in life and what can, you know, in, how you can improve your career in a way. Maybe you want to earn more money. Maybe you want to work in a startup. Maybe you want to travel. So it lists down those kind of things which are important to you and then communicates those to you. So in a job listing. So instead of seeing just, okay, here are the companies you can go, here are the th companies we suggest that might you like and the reasons behind them is you said that you know you're interested about startups or you're interested about raise. It evaluates you. It says that that's your value and that's how much you can earn, not just being going to the company and they say, okay, that's the the salary what we pay you. But in, instead of like saying, here's the mar market average, here's how much you can earn, and here how much you can improve. It's about you as a person. It's not about the the idea of listing just tops. It's, it's a really meaningful experience. And actually, it started from this before we got there. So it was just a job listing site. used created with more visual design, like like we used visual design just to make it more fun. But it doesn't, the, the meaningful experience was missing. It was just a job listing made in a different way. Another good experience uh, recently uh, I was part of, uh, I guess you have known this company called Belkin. They make IoT devices that you can use at home. And their product today looks like something like this, which allows you to switch on those devices, which is purely about functionality. And it's usable as well. I, I think you can figure out what to do with that button. It's not that hard to use. And most really it's reliable as well. It works. But is that how we operate our home? Do we work in our home in a, in a way that, okay, here are the switches, I push the buttons. No, we don't. We work in a home, or we live in our home as human beings. We have different moods. I don't know, we have dinner. We go, uh, go away, we're not at a home anymore. A lot of things happen there. And we created experience which actually adopts those life moments and tries to be there when you need it. So if you want to create a romantic theme, you want to enjoy a movie night, I don't know that actually adopts your house and the devices to create that emotion or mood in your house. So it's not just about buttons, it's more about how you feel yourself at your home. And then this is something which serves a minimum. And emotion design as such tries to elicit those appropriate emotions. So it's pure about emotion. And why I highlight, highlighted the word up appropriate is that that's the future, being relevant. The examples you have seen, a lot of those examples are still linear experiences, which means designers craft stories, and then they put them up somewhere as a product, as a website, and people consume them. But the problem with those kind of things is they're, as I mentioned, they are crafted by a person, and they don't adapt in any environment, but not in all of the environments. For example, if if I make a choke, which I'm gonna do, some of you would not understand that because it's not relevant for you. And yeah, I see people who are just, you know, whatever that means. But as an English speaker, for example, in a living in UK, in US, I create a product which use cultural jokes or tries to elicit emotions with a joke, let's say, having a a human type of experience in our copy. I, I make a joke, 
and then a person from Estonia comes to a website and looks at this and, you know, meh, I don't get it. So the emotions or the experiences designers create in stories or websites or products, they don't usually adapt to environment. And that's actually really hard to do. So you might ask, okay, you know, how you can track my emotions? What's the method of doing that? Yes, we do have a technology today available ready for that. We have option to track your facial expressions, but you need to wear a mask every day and go around like this with something tracking your face always. I think nobody would like to do that. But there are a lot of other ways as well. And then comes to machine learning where emotional design becomes something new. Because as I mentioned, most people crave for emotions. They want to live emotional life as we do in everyday lives. And they want the same experiences in digital products. Yet we still don't consider that always. And how that machine learning could help us is it could use the data it has about us. We're still scared about maybe data, okay. You know, products collect their data the way you have used that. And then the, pro the system can learn about your culture, learn about where you come from, who you are, and then create story for you. And that's created by system, not by a designer, which makes us think, okay, why we need designers for that, if you want to create the emotional experiences. Emo designers or humans are always going to be there for curating those things, because machines need to be teached, like child, that here are the things about, go, f go look for those kind of books which tell about the culture of Estonia. Go look there, the news or the things, culture about that particular nation. And then, if you have learned those kind of things, run us some samples, and we just approve that, okay, these things look okay. It's not really abusing the thing. And the future is now. You might ask, how it's now? Uh, we don't get tracked by devices. Why run a, I don't wear a, a facial expression detecting machine everywhere. It's an interesting thing where it, it's already used and how we actually even don't notice it or maybe not really using properly. And it's the voice, the way I speak on the stage. It carries, it, it can carry idea, but it carries a lot of emotions. At least I try to do that. <laughs> I give my best. Uh, and that voice is used already today in our everyday life. So if you look in the future or to now, what kind of emotional experiences we can create that adapt to, our, to, our, to, our, to the moment, that basically know that I'm in the mood of watching a movie, or I'm happy, or I'm sad, or I'm frustrated. So our voice carries th the information, and using those kind of devices, there is already something in the th market. For example, just baby steps, baby steps. The device is getting better every day. Just a few years ago, actually, if I'm not right, uh, if I'm wrong, just four years ago, Amazon Alexa started this voice kind of assistant approach, which would sit in your home or everywhere around you. And that sounded like a crazy idea, you know. I don't want to have a device at my home which would listen to me and but it's now there already over 5000 devices only in Alexa's world use voice assistant approach which has a mic in the inside connects to the internet can detect your voice can come up with expressions can know that are you feeling good or bad because let's say you're really anxious i don't know you want to get down the road and you know have a meeting up and then the assistant will say a choke or starts an unrelevant emotion experience, which is not meant for it. So, good example. Please, could you add milk to my shopping list? Thanks for asking nicely. Or these small things. Noticing that you use word please can help detect us and saying, okay, you're in the mood of kind of that, or in the mood of rush. If you say short, add milk to my shopping list, or please add milk to my shopping list. Those kind of the, the, the data we, we have in our voice helps, helps future to create experiences or the, that adopt our, our lives and create appropriate emotions, their relevant emotions. 
And yeah, why now? Uh, I created a graph which tries to explain why emotional design is the design which becomes more important. It comes to craft with the words I've represented before. So we started with digital experiences. I, I counted this from the age where internet started, where those you know, became blooming. So we talk about reliability back then, like can the technology work, is it usable? Um, then the functionality plume started. We had a lot of great ideas. We were able to create products that help to solve problems that had a lot of functions. And then the area of usability started, user experience. What makes sense? <laughs> like, can we use that product? Is that valuable for a customer? And th that happened because of technology, not because of just something. And if you look in the future, we, we see that the technologies that become available are about pleasure, are about emotions, not just about functionality, not just about usability, not just being reliable, but they become more about a human, how we live in this world and how we want to consume the products, the digital world. So thank you. That was the presentation about emotional design and technology and all that. Go emotional. Thank you, Stefan. Deep stuff, deep stuff. So uh, my first question to you is uh, going the extra mile for a smile. You yep. asked us to remember that, so I did pretty well. I remember that. But uh, my question about that then is uh, uh, thinking back to what James explained before is how you as a designer need to demonstrate uh, business value always. So many of the examples that you showed, they were beautifully crafted and produced. It yep. can also be quite expensive. So as a business owner, I'm could ask, you know, is, is that worth the cost? As a designer, oh, I'm sure you have been absolutely. in those kind of situations. How do you, what do you do then? Yeah, so if, if you look how people operate and what makes a remarkable product, and you question yourself, we, we heard of this word, uh, word of mouth, when people start recommending your product to other people. And that as a designer or as a business is our, you know, primary goal that people actually feel this product is great, I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna use it every day, I'm gonna recommend it to friends. And you might question yourself, when is the moment when you say this product is worth of spreading, saying to somebody, oh, you know, that's a imaginary experience. When that happens. And I think that happens when we feel strong emotional connection with that product. We feel that this product is more than just everything else on the market. We feel this does serve a purpose. It provides us this emotional value. Because if you go to the store, as I mentioned, you buy a shoe, you know, there's somebody who's helping you to buy that, there's this emotion experiences related to that, which helps to make more money. Emotions drive our actions in this world, and that action of buying things is valuable for your business. So I think that's where the, the devil is hidden. Okay, one question from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, I'm a uh, uh, product owner and designer from Yaknam, so we are doing farmers uh, software yeah. that they could use for the farm. Uh, so I'd like to now go home and uh, after hearing your lecture or uh, presentation, uh, to add some emotion, some more pleasure, preserval experience to my application. So yeah. is there some uh, list that you use uh, when you start want to do something more emotional? Uh, first of all, like, is there a like set of techniques to do this emotional design? Uh, and second, like, how do you test it with users? How do you actually confirm that this design is more emotional right now and it actually brings the business value uh, yeah. with this change? Yeah. The first thing I would do is would try to use that product myself and compare it with everything else in the world and say, is that delightful? Do I feel that that's you know easy and pleasant to use? If I start to close my eye for certain things, let's say, okay, I know that's there, you know, I'm gonna that touch that. I think that's the ballpark. You have to go over there. You have to feel yourself that that's worth of trading. That's it's it's great to use. And then I would start looking for 
either that product have a correct uh, a person, uh, like a personality, like like uh, as I mentioned, there's examples of of using copy smart in a way that express you know as a, a regular message in a human way, where it's uh, not just saying hello, but saying how's it going, James, just putting it in a different format. So those kind of things I would look for. Th there's no right and wrong. There is nothing we can guarantee that elicit emotions. It's about testing out and going and looking for those kind of things. All right. uh, Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions for now, but yeah. uh, Stefan will be around later, and he will be happy to continue talking about uh, uh, all this stuff. Thank so you. So that's, that's thanks, Stefan. <laughs>